First John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, I never tire of giving praise to your name that you have spoken. May we never tire, Lord, of the recognition that you've spoken that the word became flesh, that you're not simply a dictator from heaven, that you're not simply one who tells us rules to follow, but that you have shown us the path of life. And Lord, we choose this day to walk in it. Would you, Lord, come and meet us? As we sang earlier, Spirit of the living God, would you fall afresh on us? Would you melt us in the places, Lord, where we are hard right now? Would you mold us, Lord, so that we can become useful vessels? And would you then fill us with your spirit that we would have the power to do what you've made us to do? And then, oh God, would you use us? Would you use us for your glory? Come and meet us this day. Let us taste and see freshly that our God lives. Our God lives. And we praise your name. In Jesus' name alone. Amen. You may be seated. What are your idols? What are your idols? I'm not talking about Billy, nor am I talking about American, although they may have something to do with what we are talking about. When I ask what are your idols, I'm talking about things like these, fame, money, success, power, beauty, and knowledge. Idols, anything in your life that is a God substitute, anything that takes the place that only God should have, makes promises that only God should make, but oh, here's the kicker. It comes at a discounted cost, which by the way is always a trap. We'll get there. It's always a trap. What are your idols? We've seen them play out in our culture time and time again. In fact, in sports, you can see the idol for fame and accomplishment take place when it comes to things like steroids, right? Barry Bonds, here's the before and after pictures. Look at the size of his head. Your head doesn't grow after you become an adult, right? Like your, your head's done growing, but when you're little, and all of a sudden, here we have Barry Bonds, who's grown massively. He was an incredible baseball player, would have been in the Hall of Fame, but took steroids because he wanted to be the best. And he currently holds the home run record in all of baseball, but you know where he's not? The Hall of Fame. You see, steroids and his passion for fame made promises, gave real power. He got big, but they robbed him of the very thing it promised. In the ancient world, you could tell what people's idols were because they had statues and temples. There's the statue of, who's the the ocean god? Say it again. Poseidon, Poseidon or Neptune, right? Here you have Poseidon at Virginia Beach and his temple, which is found in Greece, right? 
Don't you wish it was that easy today for us to be able to kind of understand what our idols are? Well, guess what? It is that easy today. We have our own statues. We just happen to live in them. The things that we want to grab everyone's attention so that they could see and worship. Selfies so that I can post for the world to see. And then the platform, the stage on which to post them, social media. Sure, they still include things like our homes and our cars. Those are our temples for sure. But our bodies and our lives have very much become the one thing that we're all on the same page, that it's okay to worship. Pro tip, it's not okay to worship our bodies. It's not okay to worship our fame. Any idol is going to destroy us. That's where we're going. What are your idols? Do you know them? It matters that we ask the question and that you're honest about the answer because today we continue in our study through this book of First John, a letter written by a guy that we've been calling Grandpa John. He's at the end of his life, and in fact, this is the very end of the letter. This is the last week we're going to be in the study of John. Over the summer, we'll be studying through some particular psalms, so get ready. Um, but this is the last week in the book of First John, and what we see is this call to walk in love. And we've seen some powerful stuff, haven't we? Where he says that th this is love, that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ will cleanse us from all of our sins. This is love that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. This is love, not that we love in, in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth, that it's actually tangible. We've seen again and again and again profound declarations of what love looks like. And so when we come to the end of this letter, what would you expect the end to be? Something like, you know, be like Jesus or remember all the things I just wrote about. But what does Grandpa John write? He writes, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It kind of sounds like a letter that we would get from Grandma, Bl Grandma Bloom, Grandma Eva, who my daughter is named after, Kristen's grandma. She would write these letters, handwritten to all 20-something of her grandchildren, right? And, uh, and she'd write these profound prayers and blessings. And then she would, at the end, she'd be like, I just saw a squirrel pass in front of my window. Love, Grandma. And you're like, like what? what's wrong with Grandma? Like, is, does she have some screws loose? Is she losing her mind? Is she just cute? Is she being silly? What's the deal? Is she cute? Or is she actually a window into what Grandpa John wants us to see throughout this entire letter, not cuteness, but confidence. If you don't understand what I'm getting at, keep listening. Confidence, first and foremost, in our eternal standing. Verse 13 says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So there's no doubt where you're going. Eternal life is already broken in. You know where you're going. You know what that does? It gets rid of fear. In fact, John says it in the letter, does he not? Perfect love drives out fear for fear has to do with punishment. Well, guess what you're not gonna face if you already have eternal life? Punishment, why? Because Jesus has already faced it for you. It drives out fear, which means anxiety should not be a regular part of our lives. It doesn't mean anxiety doesn't break in. Listen, I get anxiety too, but what it means is we now have a weapon against anxiety. We now have something to do when anxiety comes knocking. Because we know where we're going. The end of the story is already written. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Our souls are anchored in heaven, in the holy place behind the curtain. We know where we're going. No fear, which means we don't have to try to perform anymore. That's, that's good news for me. As someone who's, for his entire life, tried to prove my worth, the good news is Jesus has already done it. I'm set free from what everyone else thinks. But you know what I'm constantly battling? What everyone else thinks. And so now I have a weapon called the truth to put on. Grandpa John wants us to be confident in our eternal standing. So that because we know where we're going, we don't have to be afraid of where we are. Second, 
He wants us to be confident in our prayers. Verse 14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Or to put it differently, alignment yields agreement. How many of you have ever been to Disney World before? Let's see your hands. Don't be bashful. Okay, how many of you have ever been on that, this ride right here? You see a picture called the Grand Prix, right? Or the Autobahn or whatever they call it. It's this ride where you're in a car, but there's a track. Right? And so you can't go sort of fast, not really, but you can't move anywhere that the track doesn't want to turn, uh, take you. So if you want to turn right and the track's going left, you can turn to the right, but you'll go like this and turn to the left, right? Like you won't be able to go where the track doesn't want to take you. God says the same thing is true with our prayers. He says so often we pray things that are not of God and then wonder why we don't get them. God, take this burden from me. And God's like, don't you understand that's a weapon? I mean, a a tool that I'm going to use to help shape you? You just sang a song, melt me. What does God use to melt us? Fire, suffering, pain. Uh, Let's not sing that song again, right? If we're asking for it and he's promised to use it, he's gonna give it. But if we say, that I want a life without suffering, you know what he's going to say? Wait till heaven. That life doesn't exist this side of earth. Or how about if we say, God, I'm going to choose to love these people, but that person is the bane of my existence, and so please curse that person. You know what God's going to say? No. You know why? Because he says, if you claim to love me, who you've not seen, and yet hate your brother or sister who you do see, You're a liar. The truth is not in you. You cannot hold a grudge against someone here and claim to know the one who is perfect and complete love, who does not treat you as your sins deserve. Do you see? He wants our prayers to be in alignment with what he's already doing. And so Grandpa John says, I want you to know the will of God. Because as you know where the track goes, you can start to pray according to the track. And you know what happens when you pray according to God's track? Power. Power. You start to see answers to prayer that blow your socks off. You're like, I didn't know this person could change. I didn't know you could provide this. I didn't know you were going to open up all these doors with my job. I didn't know you were going to be able to do this. And God's like, who do you think I am? I'm God. You don't even exist unless I say it. You have no air in your lungs unless I give it. The world doesn't spin on its axis unless I tell it to. And yet it continues to do all those things because I'm me. And I'm your dad. And I love you. Who do you think I am? Grandpa John has lived his whole life following Jesus. He was the youngest of all the disciples who walked with Jesus, who was the disciple Jesus loved. He was the little brother in the group. He was the one who didn't die a martyr's death. He died of old age. Every other disciple died a martyr's death. He's the one who was on, in exile on the Isle of Patmos who wrote the book of Revelation. He was the one who then lived with the Ephesians for 15 years in Ephesus, and that's the church to whom he's writing this letter so that all might know, hey, at the end of my life, as I've lived with Jesus, as I've seen the resurrected Jesus with my own eyes, both immediately afterward and then years later on Patmos, as I've seen him and talked to him and touched him, here's the most important thing. I want you to be confident in your eternal standing. I want you to be confident in your prayers. And I want you to be confident in your intercession. What's intercession? Intercession is when I pray for someone else. What intercession is he talking about specifically? Perhaps you, this stood out to you as Christian was reading it, but it says this in verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give it to him. Well, that's clear. So whoever's not committing the sin that leads to death, God's going to hear our prayers. Amen. Let's move on. What? What's the sin not leading to death? What's the sin leading to death? If you've been listening... You know the answer to both of those questions because John's already given it. The sin that leads to death. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. He says in verse 17, what sin does not lead to death? Well, John's told us. 1 John 1, 9. 
If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. So what sin leads to death? Unconfessed sin. Sin that we don't actually bring to the Lord. Sin that we say, I don't need to bring to the Lord. In in, in chapter 2, he says, we have Jesus as the propitiation for our sin. In other words, he's already paid the price. He's covered us with his blood. What sin leads to death? Any sin that isn't taken before Jesus, that isn't given to him. Or like Paul writes to the church in Rome, anyone who calls on the name of Jesus is going to be saved. And those who don't, won't. It's like my doctor keeps telling me, every man in their lifetime is going to have prostate issues. You know the ones that will survive them? The ones that get checked. You know the ones that won't survive prostate issues? The ones that don't. You, prostate issues, 100% preventable. Preventable, 100%. Unless you don't actually get them checked out. Unless you're one of the ones who says, I don't have any issues, no big deal for me. God says the same thing is true with our sin. If we are those who say, I don't need this, God, then we're the ones who say, I don't need his grace. I don't need this Jesus. And therefore, we, we don't get him. Sin that does lead to death is what we've just been talking about, pride. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, he says, if, if you claim to have not sinned, you make God out to be a liar, and the truth is not in you. But he says, if you walk in in darkness and claim to be in light, you're also a liar. What is he saying? He's saying we need to have integrity with our hearts and our mouths. We can say things are true of ourselves when at the end of the day, we also know the the secret parts, the places we hide, the things we say, no, I don't want God to have access to this part of my soul. And God's saying, that's the very reason why I've come into your life is to access that part. And can I just say this out loud? That makes us really uncomfortable. We like a safe God. God is not safe. Not if by safe what we mean is controllable, distant, at my beck and call. God is safe if by that we mean surgeon who is going to do everything necessary to get the cancer called sin out of us, even and especially when it hurts. When we say, I'm not a sinner, I'm not infected, I'm a good person, I don't need him, then we're denying Jesus, his sacrifice, and every, all the benefits therein. Now, I understand that, that that makes sense. And for those of you who've been around the church for a while, you're like, sure, I get this. Fine. Uh, move on. Next point. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Are you? Because remember, Grandpa John's writing to a bunch of believers, a bunch of Christians who got this too. Why would he be emphasizing keep yourself from idols, little children? If not because idols are deceptive. We think we are not following idols. I'm following Jesus. I'm okay. And the whole time, we're actually selling our souls because we think there are better promises with less cost. Let me give you a few examples. First, in Jesus' own life. You remember when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River? And then it says the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit takes him out into the wilderness and he's there fasting and praying for 40 days and he's tempted. And you're like, how is this a temptation? It's Jesus, right? Like, like Jesus is gonna be tempted? Come on, give me a break, right? Really? So after f- fasting for 40 days with no food, you think that Jesus isn't hungry? So when the Satan comes to him, Satan, which means deceiver, comes to him and says, if you really are the son of God, turn these stones into bread, insinuating this, you shouldn't have to be this hungry. Just feed yourself, which is the very temptation that the children of Israel faced for 40 years in the wilderness. We shouldn't have to be hungry. If you really loved us, you'd feed us. And if Jesus gave into that temptation, guess what he'd no longer be? The perfect son of God. What's the next one? 
Take yourself up to the pinnacle of the temple. Throw yourself down. Put God to the test. You need to make sure. Listen, you're about to do some crazy stuff. You need to make sure you can trust God. Does that sound familiar to you? That's our struggle all the time, is it not? I don't, I'm not going to step out in faith. I want you to show me first, God. And then after you show me and I know it's safe, then I'll walk out. Guess what God is never going to do? That's one of those prayers where he's going to keep saying to you, no, I've called you to walk by faith. And as you take a step, I'll meet you. But I want you to step out. If Jesus had listened to that prayer, what would he have gotten? Or that, that temptation, rather. What would he have gotten? Fame, glory. The whole, all of Israel would have seen the angels come to Jesus' aid and save him. Guess what they would have not done to Jesus? Crucified him. They would have made, have made him king immediately. And if Jesus isn't crucified, guess what happens to us? And guess what happens to the greater glory that Jesus earned through his obedience and suffering. All lost. You tracking with me? Real temptations. But the third was the worst. Because Satan says, listen, I know why you've come. You want this. These fallen sinners. I'll give you all of them. All you need to do is bow down and worship me. Translation. I'll give you what your father's promising you, but without the cross. You think that wasn't tempting? And yet if Jesus had obeyed, had listened to the temptation and worshiped the devil, guess what, we, what he would have re received? All of us. And guess where all of us would have been going? To hell with the Lord of darkness. Do you see? The temptations are real but they're all lies. They're all traps, okay? How did that play out in ancient Israel's life? Well, in ancient Israel, they had all these different idols, like, like Baal or Baal is how you say it in Hebrew, right? Like Baal was this idol that was the, the god of fertility. That when you're an agricultural society, guess what you need? Rain. Baal was the god of thunder, the lord of thunder. He was the first Thor, right? He, was the god, he would bring the rain. You needed rain. And idols, friends... Idols that Paul says are actually demons, they have real power. And so when they would worship Baal, guess what it would do? It would rain. They had real power. There was a reason why they did it. And yet, you know what they ended up doing in order to worship Baal? First of all, they had to wed themselves to their enemies. To the very people that wanted to kill them, they said, oh, we'll follow you. We'll be close to you. How do you think that's going to work out for them? Secondly, in order to, to worship Baal, you know what you needed? temple prostitutes because the only way to worship a god of fertility is to be fertile and so you would go and have sex with temple prostitutes sacrificing the daughters of Israel so that Baal could be satisfied and the whole time turning your back on the one God who said I am your redeemer I'm the one who's going to do anything and everything necessary to save you. I brought you up out of Egypt. Is there anything I won't do for you? The temptation was real. The promise and the power was real. But it was all a trap. How does this play out in our lives? Well, let me give you two examples. First, greed. Let me define greed this way. Greed is pride manifested through money. Greed is pride manifested through money. What does that mean? Well, listen, God blesses us. Some of us have lots of money. Some of us have medium money. Some of us have small money. No money. And we're all in this together, right? Money is not the issue. The love of money is. The love of money is. So when I use my money for my identity, for my comfort, for my security, that's when I know I'm actually worshiping the wrong God. Let me give you a, a, a few things, like litmus tests. When COVID happened and the stock market started to crash, how was your anxiety level? Since the stock market kind of rebounded, how much time have you been spending on your investments? Is there anything wrong with spending time on investments? No. But when you're consumed by it? Here's another litmus test. 
How are you with your giving? Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said, the Lord delights in a cheerful giver. And then he talks about this sowing and reaping principle. What you sow, you will reap. If you sow sparingly, you'll, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow abundantly, you'll reap abundantly. Life upon life is what it says. How are you in sowing what God has given you into the lives of other people who need it? You remember what I just said? Some of us have lots. Some of us have none or little. Guess why God has given you lots of money if you're one of the lots? It's not for you. It's not for you. It's for you to use for his purposes in the lives of the people around you, in the lives of the people around the world that need to know him. We exist on this planet for one reason, to know him and make him known. It's two sides of the same coin, to know him and make him known. And if we're not using our money and our time and all of our resources to that end, guess what we're doing? We're creating a different universe that revolves around the wrong God who just happens to look like me. How are you doing with that? You know, Jesus tells a parable where he says, it's not just our joy that we lose, but when we worship the God of mammon is what money is called, we actually lose our lives. He says, there's a rich man who's made so much stuff. So he has so many crops that he has to build a second barn rather than give away the second stuff to those who have needs. He builds a second barn because he's going to be able to have it forever for him and the generations after him. And you know what, what God says or what the prophet says, what Jesus says? You fool. <laughs> Don't you know that tonight your soul will be demanded of you? You've sold your soul to this idol called money that makes promises it cannot keep and actually robs you of joy and your very life. Do you struggle there? If so, let me encourage you, just invite God in. This is not a shaming session. We've all got struggles, all of us. It's a freeing session. Be honest and invite him in. Another one, fame. Fame is something we, we, we talked a little bit about. It's, it's what these phones are all about, right? It's all the pictures, the selfies, the social media, the websites, all the things, the YouTubes that we want to be posting our face on. So the world can see. What is fame? Pride on screen. It's pride on stage, and the stage just happens to be the screen. When we live for the instant gratific gratification, Insta gratification, Instagram, right? When we live for the instant gratification of having the voices of so many people say, yes, you're pretty. I posted this picture, and 400 people told me how pretty I am. You know what that does? Nothing. It boosts you up, woo! And then the next day, guess what? Where's my next picture? I need that shot in my arm. And if only 350 people like it, guess what? Oh, I'm not as pretty today. Did you change from yesterday to today? Or are you worshiping the wrong God? The wrong God that actually says to you, you are that worthless. Your value is that fickle. And not just is your value that fickle, but guess what? If people don't think you're awesome, we've given them the right to cancel you. That's how unimportant we think you are. You get to be canceled and not just eliminated from Facebook or social media. Do you know that there are actually suicide challenges on social media? There are Benadryl challenges. How many Benadryl pills can you take? Glorifying. Suicide. There are hang yourself challenges. How long can you last before you pass out? And if you die, that's great. Social media has not only given our, our society and particularly our young people an avenue, a venue for worshiping self, it's also given clear direction for how to take yourself out if no one's worshiping you. What? are we doing? Idols are a trap. They're a lie. And they're designed to try to rob us of the very life that God has given, the only God that there is. That's why Grandpa John goes out of his way to say, if you know your idols, then expose them. 
expose them and resist them. Be like my buddy Jason in Chattanooga who had caller ID before caller ID was really a thing. And he would see when the telemarketers and the scammers were calling and he was the best. He would, he would get us all around so we can listen in and he'd go bring, bring and he'd be like, I've been waiting for your call. And the telemarketer would be like, excuse me, I've been waiting for your call. The stars are in alignment. I feel good energy coming from you. Do you see that chakra outside of your window? Like all of these lines that would just grab their attention really weird and then he'd be like, can you hold for a minute? And then he'd put the phone down and get pots and pans and start banging them around his room. And he would time to see how long that telemarketer would stay on the phone before they hung up. That's genius, genius. Exposing the scam because he knew it was coming. We are to do the same thing with our idols. When I know my heart struggles with greed and, and I'm tempted to be a tightwad or I'm tempted to be afraid and say, ah, I can't give to that need even though God's brought it right in front of me because then I'm gonna dip into this retirement or I'm gonna not have funds for this or I'm gonna have to sacrifice that. God says, you know what I want you to do? Lean in and put on the truth. Put on the truth. The God who's given me everything is the God who's going to direct my steps and provide for all of my needs, even when he's called me to sacrifice. Put on the truth. Call it out for what it is. When you feel that <gasps> anxiety, don't just be a slave to your feelings. Know why you feel the way that you feel so that you can do what it says Jesus does in Psalm chapter two. He says, the son laughs as the nations rage against him. When there's war that's coming against the Son of God, he laughs. You know why? Because he knows they can't hurt him. It's the same thing that in chapter 5 of our text for this morning, it says, those who are born of God, evil cannot touch. It's an echo of what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5 when he says, the devil is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What does he say? He doesn't say, run from him. He's going to hurt you. He says, resist him and watch him run from you because he can't hurt you expose and resist the devil and all of his minions, these idols in our lives. When, if you're tempted to get on Facebook or social or Instagram or, or TikTok or whatever, and to, to look and have FOMO, fear of missing out, oh, I should be there, I should be, I'm missing out on something, or to post picture after picture, I'm gonna have my fame here. Here's what you do. Make your social media account more about your friends than about you. Make your social media account an, an opportunity to lean in to blessing others. Undermine the power of the idol in your life. Don't feed it because it will destroy you. And if you need to take a break, guess what? You'll still be breathing if you get rid of your social media accounts. It's okay. It's okay. Expose and resist because friends, when you do, that's when you'll start to be confident. When you start to unleash the power of grace in your life. You're revealing the lies and putting on the truth that you might walk in life, and in love rather. And what does the, the apostle say? He says, this is the whole reason why I'm writing this. I want you to be confident in your eternal standing so that your prayers are in line with where God has you going. So that when you pray for other people, you know beyond a doubt that those prayers are effective. And you know who did that well? Grandma Eva. I met her again. I knew her when I was really little, when she was in her 90s. And she loved me well. She lived just long enough to meet the baby named after me. That's what she said. This is for the baby that's gonna be named after me as she knit a blanket for Eva. Lived 97, 97 years old. That's a long life. But while others in her shoes might have been looking, clamoring for the next medicine to extend life just a little bit longer, worshiping the idol of long life, worshiping the idol of control, worshiping the need to try to establish something for herself. You know what she was doing? Fixing her eyes on her eternal standing, on the one who's anchored her in heaven, and then praying for those that God had put in her life with confident prayers in alignment with the will of God and trusting that even when she goes to heaven, 
the God who's already caring for all of her grandkids isn't going to stop. She was confident. She died a strong death, going to glory and saying to the grave, where again is your sting? It has been swallowed up by the cross of Jesus Christ. Beloved, walk in the way of love. This is the message of 1 John. Walk in it. Know the one who is love. Give everything to him and watch as he reshapes your life from the inside out. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Jesus, we are grateful that you are who you are, that you're not just the God who gives us love, that you are love himself, that everything you do is loving, that everything you are is loving. And so, Lord, as we come to you and as we've tried for the last several months to unpack this, this book, this letter written by a granddad in the faith to his sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters saying, learn from my life and fall in love with the Savior, our first love. Jesus, would you hear our prayer as even now we confess to you those places in our lives that we've heard you whispering to us week in and week out. Those idols that we have been tempted to make our first love and they are anything but, they're traps. So we call them out right now in Jesus' name. We ask, oh God, that you would give us the courage to resist, to resist them. And instead to put on the truth that we are sons and daughters of the living God that everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. The door is wide open. And so God, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Root us and establish us in your love. And Lord, let us be a people that leave this place full of you and ready, willing vessels to do whatever you would have us do. Show us this day, we pray in Jesus' name.